This is going to be 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we see a lot in the first 10 verses about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the second coming, Jesus Christ comes back with all his saints to get rid of the God-haters and set up his kingdom. And to be on the winning side at the second advent, you need to make sure you have believed the gospel. The gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. If you believe this gospel, then you are saved. If you reject it, then you are lost. But looking at 1 Thessalonians 5, let's start in verse 1. It says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. The time, times refers to years, as it does in Revelation 12, 14, and the seasons refers to summer, winter, spring, fall. And Paul says he has no need to write to us about the times and seasons. And verse 2 says, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. This shows us that we shouldn't waste too much time with ministers whose whole ministry is based around the times and seasons. If someone's whole ministry is about when the time of Jacob's trouble will begin or the last days, then don't spend too much time listening to that person. All many men want to talk about is the Illuminati, the weather, the music industry, the signs in the skies. Or anything else that they can try to line up with in times Bible prophecy. And they don't want to, a lot of people don't want to listen to people who don't say something about this stuff in every single message. People like listening and watching ministries like this because it gives their flesh a thrill. Maybe you like watching it because it thrills your spirit. Because Jesus is returning soon. But don't spend all your time with times and seasons ministries. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Mark 13, 32 says, No man knows the day and hour, but it may be possible for someone to know the times and seasons. And Luke 12, 38 says, And it, if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not suffered his house to be broken through. Maybe God is giving us a hint that he comes in the fourth watch, 3 to 6 a.m. And I'm referring to the second advent. Matthew 14, 25 says this, In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Because as you know, there is another sea in the Bible located above our head the sea of glass in the fourth watch of the night jesus went into them walking on the sea don't miss the cross reference to habakkuk 315 thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters not saying this for certain but just something to think about and get you interested in studying the bible we can find out what the day of the lord is by simply searching the phrase for example one verse says this, Isaiah 13 and verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Isaiah 34, 8 and Jeremiah 46, 10 talk about the day of the Lord as a day of vengeance. Isaiah 13, 9, which we just read, talks about it being a day of wrath that is cruel, fierce, angry, and a time when sinners are destroyed. Jeremiah 46, 10 also talks about a sword that devours on the day of the Lord. The sword will be drunk with their blood. Joel 2, 1 calls it a time of trembling. Joel 2, 3 says the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Amos 5, 18 says it is darkness and not light. Zephaniah 1 7 says it is a day of sacrifices. Zephaniah 1 14 calls it a day of crying. Zephaniah 1 18 calls it a day of fiery jealousy. Zephaniah 2 2 calls it a day of anger. Malachi 4 
and verse 5 says it is a great and dreadful day. And by reading all the verses that say day of the Lord, you can easily come to the conclusion that is primarily referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it seems to cover, cover more than that. It seems that the day of the Lord is the time after the rapture through the millennial kingdom. But with this in mind, let's go through the Bible and learn about the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. First we see the day of the Lord is as frightening as being overtaken by a thief. Have you ever been woke up by the sound of someone breaking in your home? Waking up out of a deep sleep to the sound of a thief can be a terrifying experience. And people in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, are going to be in a deep sleep. This is exactly what happens during the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. People will be spiritually asleep and not expecting his return. Then all of a sudden they see Jesus Christ, the thief, coming out of the clouds. Revelation 1-7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Jesus Christ is referred to as a thief. In scripture and this world belongs to the devil the Bible calls him the God of this world the devil would be the strong man and Jesus Christ is coming back to bind the strong man and he is taking from Satan what is rightfully belongs to him he does this by coming as a thief in the night Satan is said to steal kill and to destroy and that is nothing but a copycat of what Jesus Christ does at the advent not only does Jesus Christ come like a thief, all his saints come back like thieves as well. And Joel chapter 2 gives a great description of the army that comes down behind Jesus Christ. Here is one of the descriptions about them, or should I say about us. Joel 2 9 says, They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run up on the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. As I said before, many men spend all their time with a last days type of ministry. All they want to talk about is the end times, while some go the opposite extreme, and they know nothing about the last days or that Jesus Christ is even coming back again. They are caught up in the world. Christians should be waiting for Jesus Christ to come back and occupy until he comes. And here are some verses about watching so that Jesus Christ doesn't come upon you as a thief. I believe these verses are referring to Jesus Christ coming coming on someone as a thief at the second coming. And that, I mean specifically, at the second coming. But we can take spiritual application and apply it to our attitude towards the rapture, which is just the first part of the second coming. Revelation 3.3 3 says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Revelation 16.15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. If you aren't watching and waiting for the Lord to pick you up at the rapture, then that day may overtake you as a thief. Just like the men in the tribulation, when Jesus Christ returns as a thief and overtakes them as a thief. All born again believers will go up in a rapture. That happens before the time of Jacob's trouble, what we often refer to as the great tribulation. And at the end of this tribulation, Jesus comes back and overtakes them as a thief. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This brings us to our next point. At the second advent, men will be all about peace and safety. You can already see this happening now. People are always talking about world peace and wanting peace. The United Nations supposedly want world peace. When you go to work every day, all you hear about is safety and how you need to put safety first and not get injured on the job. The truth is, there won't be any peace and safety until the Prince of Peace shows up. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, 
the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and a, a fake Christ, the Antichrist, is said to gain his power through peace and flatteries. And Daniel 8.25, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Daniel 11.21, And his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he's going to claim to be peaceful, but is really wicked in his heart. And people be running around saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Many are always doing selfies, holding up a peace sign. And the peace sign resembles the sign of a bowman. And the Antichrist is a bowman. He has a bow with no arrows, and this is because he comes in peaceably. Revelation 6-2, And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. You don't get peace until you get saved. And then you won't truly live in peace until you are physically living with the Prince of Peace. Those who reject Christ and never get saved will live in a place without peace, with no rest day or night. And 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Not only is there no peace and safety, but it will be sudden destruction at the second advent. Joel one fifteen says, Alas, for that day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Men like to destroy things. They like to vandalize and destroy other people's property. Someone destroyed the Ten Commandments statue. People destroy Bibles and burn them. Atheists want to destroy Christianity in the name of Jesus Christ. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. At the advent, Jesus Christ comes back and destroys those who want to destroy him. All of their precious material items will be destroyed. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.8 says, "...in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ." They set up treasures on earth instead of getting saved and setting up treasures in heaven. You know what happens when you set up treasures on earth? Thieves can break through and steal. And Jesus Christ comes back as a thief. Matthew six nineteen. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. When Jesus Christ comes back, he comes back as a thief. He takes what is yours and destroys it. It was only yours in the first place because he let you have it. Isaiah thirteen six. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. So the day of the Lord is without peace and safety in a time of destruction. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a tra travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It is also a time of no escape. Jesus Christ is coming back in flaming fire, and there is no fire escapes. Men will try to hide in the dens and the rocks. Look at what Revelation 6, 15 through 17 says. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You can't escape. From someone who knows where you are at all times. He knows what is in the darkness. You can't hide from God. Remember how I said Joel chapter 2 gives a great description of us coming back with Jesus Christ at the advent. Look what it says in Joel 2 and verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. And Job 11:20, But the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. The next thing we see is that the day of the Lord is a day of darkness. 
Joel 2, 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Amos 5, 18, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord, to what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Amos 5, 20, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? People now are so scared of the dark they have to leave a light on. The day of the Lord will be so scary because it is darkness and not light. Movies like Pitch Black and Darkness Falls stole the idea from the Bible. Something comes to get the God-haters in the dark. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And looking at Ephesians 5.8 it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now... Are ye light in the Lord? Walk as children of light. We are the children of light because the light lives in us. And he is so much of a light that when he is present, there will be no need for the sun. As it says in Revelation 22, 5, While the saved people are the children of light, a lost man is a child of hell, as it talks about in Matthew 23, 15, And lost men are children of the devil. See 1 John 3.10. They're also children of disobedience. But as children of light, we should walk in the light as he is in the light. So people don't get us confused with a child of darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 said that we are not of the night nor of darkness. Even though the church age we are in is considered the night time, we are still children of the day because the sun of righteousness lives in us. In John 8, 12, Jesus said that he is the light of the world. And Malachi 4, 2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Notice how the word darkness in the Bible is always connected with something negative and connected with rebellion, judgment on sin, and God's wrath. The time of Jacob's trouble is God's wrath, and it's a judgment, and people are in rebellion, and it's a time of darkness. The day of the Lord will also be a time of sleeping on God. First Thessalonians 5, 6 says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Even now people are asleep on God. They are watching, they are not watching or being sober, and the only thing they are watching is the idiot box. They don't even like to have God in their thoughts. They can get up every morning and never open their Bible or pray. They can go outside and look up. And it doesn't even come to mind that God made everything that they see in the clouds and in the stars. They are asleep and blinded to the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, In whom the God of this world, which is the devil, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Lost men love the dark, because if there is no light, then you can't see the dirt in their life. Have you ever cleaned a room with the light off, and then turned on the light, and realized how dirty everything still was? You don't realize how dirty your life is until you shine the light of the words of God on your life. John 3.20 says, For every one that doeth evil, hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Even today in 2017, people have their eyes closed to the truth. They are in the dark on what is really going on. They will accept everything they see on TV and let themselves be deceived by the entertainment industry and Hollywood. And they let them mold their minds into someone who hates God. When you close your eyes, things get dark. And people who are asleep have their eyes closed to the truth. Many Christians who are supposed to be the lights in the world also have their eyes closed as well. They are so worldly that it seems they have spiritual narcolepsy because you can't keep them awake. You can hit them with the truth and they wake up for a bit and then fall right back to sleep when they hear their favorite secular song on the radio or their favorite contemporary Christian song on the radio. And sometimes when people go to sleep, they have what is called lucid dreams. This is where the dreamer knows they are dreaming when a person is having a lucid dream, they can sometimes control, they control the dream. 
and people seek lucid dreams so much that they will make dream journals to note down all of their dreams. That way they remember their dreams and are more likely to know when they are dreaming. And many see this as something fun and desirable. When they are in a lucid dream, they don't want to be woke up. And many Christians are living in the world and they're asleep. They think they are in control and they don't want to wake up out of sleep because they are having too much fun. At the rapture, these sleeping Christians will be caught by surprise when they are raptured out. They will get to the judgment seat of Christ and leave empty handed. At the second coming, lost men who have been sleeping in the dark will be woke up by the Son of Righteousness. But next we see the day of the Lord will be a time of drunkenness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. It seems that even today everyone wants to get drunk. Every country song on the radio refers to alcohol and getting drunk. If you listen to it for 30 seconds, they're going to say something about wine or getting drunk. Our Bud Light. And to justify this sin, they will say, I heard Jesus drank wine. One country singer even has a song about having a beer with Jesus. Another one said that when she dies, Jesus will be waiting for her with a glass of alcohol. They think eternity in heaven will be a time of drunkenness. And it's very blasphemous to use Jesus Christ to justify your sin. Jesus never drank alcoholic wine in the Bible. There are two kinds of wine in the scriptures, old wine and new wine. Isaiah 65, 8 says new wine is found in the cluster and it's just grape juice. When Jesus turned the water to wine, he wasn't turning, turning it into alcohol. Why would he do this when Habakkuk 2, 15 says this? Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. That verse said a man gets you to drink so he can look on your nakedness. The Bible is still relevant even though people say it is outdated. People are still doing this today. And people have wanted Jesus Christ to be a drunkard for so long. God has a sense of humor. So at the second coming the Bible describes Jesus Christ coming back just like this. It says in, seven, uh, in Psalm 78:65. Then the Lord awaked at it as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts, and he put them to a perpetual reproach. Some men are violent when they drink. And at the second advent, Jesus will be clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. He will have a sharp sword with two edges that proceeds out of his mouth. And the Bible says the blood will be up to the horse's bridles. These men wanted Jesus Christ drunk. And this is as close to it as they will see. These people wanted to drink and get drunk so much at the second advent, God gives them their wish. Because Revelation 14.10 says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The cup of their iniquity gets full and God makes them drink it. Or should I say chug it? They won't wake up with a hangover because in hell there is no rest day or night. When Jesus Christ was crucified, they stripped him naked. They wanted to humiliate him and show his nakedness. And at the advent, he would do what Nahum 3.5 talks about. It says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. Isaiah 47, 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yea, the shame, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. So you can see, when God goes uh, on to judgment on people, and gives them his wrath, their nakedness will be uncovered. Jesus Christ will make sure everyone sees their nakedness. They drink the wine of the wrath of God and everyone will look on their nakedness. People just wanted to get drunk and that is what they get. Isaiah 63, 6 says, And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. But back to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. 
we should be sober. First Peter 5 8 says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. People in the time of Jacob's trouble will be drunk and doped up. They will be easily tricked by the devil because you have to be sober and vigilant. The Bible has a lot to say about being sober. Titus 2.2 2 says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. Titus 2.4 that they may teach the young women to be sober. Titus 2.6 young men likewise exhort to be sober minded. 1 Peter 1.13 Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 4, 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. We need to be sober, awake, and watchful so that we aren't deceived. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. If you're not sober and are drunk on the things of this world, then you will have a hard time putting on your breastplate and helmet. Isaiah 59, 17 says, For he put on righteousness, as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance of, for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And you can see more about the Christian weaponry in Ephesians six twelve through seventeen. It says, "For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places." Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. But next we see the day of the Lord is a day of wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God hasn't appointed us to wrath, so the church isn't going through any of the time of Jacob's trouble. And you can prove this by Revelation chapter 6. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, opens the seals in Revelation chapter 6. That is God releasing His wrath. And the day of the Lord is a day of wrath. It isn't just the second half that is wrath, wrath, it's all of it. And Zephaniah 1.18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of His jealousy, for He shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Romans 2.5 But after thy hardness... An impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Revelation 6.17 For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? Zephaniah 1.15 That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. God hasn't appointed us to wrath. Hebrews says it's appointed for us once to die. And we're appointed to tribulation, but we're not appointed to the great tribulation. You may be going through tribulations in your life right now, but that doesn't mean you're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We are appointed to obtain salvation. We already have eternal life, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have imputed righteousness, justification, and so on. But there are some things of our salvation we have yet to obtain, like a glorified body and our rewards, our inheritance. We will get a body like Jesus Christ has at the rapture. So there's some things we haven't obtained yet when it comes to salvation. We already have eternal life. We're sealed, we're secure, we can't lose our salvation. And we're not being saved, like the new versions say, we are saved. And 1 Thessalonians 5.10 says, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. So He died for us. John 15.13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. 
Jesus Christ is the best friend you ever had. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 tells us how he died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is the gospel. The gospel means glad tidings or good news. And this is the best news we will ever receive. And if you're saved, you're going to live with Jesus Christ for eternity. And he won't be hard to live with. Even now we are sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus spiritually. And one day physically we will live together with him. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We are the bride and he is the bridegroom. If we are already spiritually living with him in high places, then we are married and not shacking up with him. If I were to lose my salvation, then I would be divorced from the family of God. And 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. These are words that you should comfort and edify each other with. If a pastor, preacher, teacher, or evangelist is going to comfort or edify others, he needs to teach these things. He needs to teach on the rapture and the good things awaiting the Christian when this is all over. He needs to teach on the day of the Lord and how we aren't appointed to wrath. I hope you have learned some things about the day of the Lord. Also, when reading your Bible, the phrase, in that day, will refer to the day of the Lord as well. For example, Zechariah 12, 9 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that I would seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 13, 2, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And, I, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And that's just a couple of examples. Next time you read through your Bible, underline that phrase in that day. And you'll see that it's referring to the day of the Lord. But we will stop here. And this has been First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11.